Good morning, everybody. And at our recent members meeting, we, um, we talked about our teaching goals for this year in the life of our church. And uh, we've set a, a teaching goal for us as a whole church to do with what it means to build an Antioch culture amongst us. And then on a personal level, we're going to be doing several things that build towards um, being secure in Christ in Britain today. So those are two of the kind of the headline things that we are aiming for. And last year we did um, quite a lot of work on discipleship. We went through the Sermon on the Mount that many of you will remember, uh, talking a lot about what it means to follow Jesus. And this book of James uh, is going to build on a lot of that. And it's going to ask some really important questions. If you follow Jesus, then how does it affect your life? How does it affect the way that you yourself face difficulties and challenges that you may experience? How does it affect your actions? How does it affect your words and your attitudes? How does it affect your sense of pride or indeed your humility? How does it affect what we know and understand of our destiny? If we're going to live securely, if we're going to live wholeheartedly knowing who we are as followers of Jesus in Britain in this generation, then there's going to be a lot for us to discover in this book of James. And so on the one hand, it's a really short book, um, actually. Uh, it's not very long. It's Sometimes you can skip over it as you're looking for something in the New Testament. But on the other hand, it's really punchy. Uh, do not underestimate what this book is going to teach us just because it's a bit shorter than the other ones. Imagine a boxing ring, if you like. And this book isn't like one of the heavyweights who are sort of maybe a bit slower and then looking for the big punch. Uh, no, this is like the little ones. Now, you're going to have to forgive me at this stage because I don't know anything about boxing. So what are they called? Are they like the featherweights or the bantamweights or something like that? For risk of making a mistake, I'm just going to use language that I understand. So we'll say the little dudes when they do the boxing and uh, they just come out of the corner and it's bang, 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 bang. And it's so fast. That is what the book of James is going to be like. It might be a bit shorter than the others, but goodness me, it is punchy. Don't underestimate the challenge of it. So James was, very, uh, James was very likely to have been written in the early stages of the, the growth of the church. And who was James? Who were we actually talking about? Well, there's a number of people in the New Testament called James, including two of the apostles. But James, the son of Zebedee, he was martyred early. James, the son of, uh, James, the son of Alphaeus, he wasn't really a very central figure. And the early church was pretty well unanimous in, in thinking that the author of this book was James, who was the half-brother of Jesus. So come with me now, if you will, to some of the most famous verses in the whole Bible. 1 Corinthians 15. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the Twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as one abnormally born, is the words of Paul. And it's that James, him, the one specifically named as a witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And James had a key role to play in the church in Jerusalem. We read when we did that series on the book of Acts, we were in Acts 15, we read about the council of Jerusalem and all the major leaders gather and they present their arguments and it seems as though James actually hosts that discussion and then he pronounces his judgment on everything that he's heard. So James, the half-brother of Jesus, the head of the church 
in Jerusalem. And he writes this book to the 12 tribes. These are very likely to be Jews that have been scattered from Jerusalem because of the persecution that they were experiencing. So they've gone from being in Israel, from being at home. They would have lost their homes. They would have lost their jobs. They're potentially in a foreign land now, um, surrounded by people who, who worship foreign gods, who, who eat differently, who speak differently, and perhaps even not even recognized by their fellow Jews because they have this new faith in Christ which was rejected by those and they're the people who've been persecuting them in Jerusalem so they're probably feeling alone they're feeling marginalized they're feeling a sense of bereavement and also going through significant financial hardship what they knew has passed and they're trying to navigate this new world that they're in I don't know about you, but if I was in those circumstances, you could be really tempted to kind of dial down your discipleship a little bit and blend in with the crowd, try and make some new friends, get yourself a job, be part of the new society because you've had enough drama already. That's why you're there. James writes this letter and it puts together several sermons and ideas together. He covers a range of things that he thinks will be helpful to the people in those circumstances. And that makes it very different from some of Paul's letters because he changes subjects so quickly and we'll see that today. It's very practical. It's got lots of exhortation, lots of encouragement, lots of warnings, but it's a bit of a scattergun approach to doing things. He's basically saying these are the key issues of the day that I want to address. Buckle up. Dun, 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 dun. Let's just go and talk about all of them. But I guess as we pick this book up together and, and as I bring this introduction to uh, an end, I just want to ask you this question. Do you feel that your life has changed in some way? And, and make you less sure of the future than you used to be? Do you feel that you're living out your faith in an environment where the people around you are hostile or not welcoming? Do you feel skint? Do you feel under financial hardship while the people around you seem to have plenty? Are you far from home and you're trying to adjust to a new place? There are so many situations that we can be experiencing that James speaks into. So this, these next few weeks as we look through this book, it's going to be something of a rallying cry. The church loses its way when it just blends in with the local culture. And as followers of Jesus, they are called to so much more. And it really does start with our hearts and our heads, what, what we believe, what we think, how that makes us feel, therefore what we say. And, and so James is going to be speaking into all of these different things. But I've definitely said enough now in introduction. Let's open the book together. And it won't surprise you to hear that we're going to start in chapter 1 and verse 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, how do you define yourself? Tell me about yourself. Oh, well, my name's Dave. I'm involved in this church called Barnabas in Shrewsbury. We're da -da -da -da. No, no, God and Jesus Christ verse 1 point 1 Jesus first serving him and this is quite interesting as well because throughout this book he describes the believers that he's writing to uh, as brothers or brothers and sisters more than 10 times in a short book he says brothers and sisters brothers but when he talks about Jesus who actually was his brother they shared a mother the Lord Jesus Christ. We must never reduce Jesus to anything less than Lord and Saviour. And yes, we can have a relationship with him. And yes, there is, there is warmth within that. But he is still the Lord. To the 12 tribes scattered among the nations, greetings. Well, if James was, uh, wrote this letter today, he'd get a return to sender on it because that is quite an open-ended address, isn't it? Because this isn't going to a specific person or people in a specific place. It's meant to be like a, a circular letter that gets distributed and goes where the people are because he won't even know where some of them are. It's to the people who have been scattered for reasons that we've already thought about. 
From verse two then, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So the goal is that we may be mature and complete, that we don't lack anything. That sounds good. And there's a pathway to this, but I'm not sure I like the pathway as much as that. Because it's testing. Testing produces perseverance. Letting perseverance continue its work leads us into maturity. So that's the pathway. And because the pathway leads to a goal that we want to get to, we consider it pure joy. We can consider it pure joy when we face the trials that cause this testing. A... Consider it joy when you face trials. Are you joking, James, mate? Seriously, I, I, I feel anything but joy when I face trials. But it's not quite as crazy as it sounds at first reading. He's very realistic, actually. Life is basically a series of challenges. At different stages in our life, things can go wrong or very wrong for, for us or for the people around us. That word various, uh, various challenge, it means many colored. There are many colors of how things can go wrong. Have you ever thought that? Wow, isn't it creative just how many things can go wrong and in so many different ways? And sometimes at the same time. Trials will come. Following Jesus does not remove that truth from us, but it can change our whole perspective. And hindsight is really important. I look back at some of the difficulties that I faced in my life, and I think to myself, you know what, Dave? It was in those days, it was through those difficulties that I've learned to lean on God. I've learned that this faith that I profess isn't just for good days and success and happiness and the sun is shining and all is well with my soul, but it's for all of life. And sometimes the light shines brighter in the darkness. Somehow I've learned stuff in those days and been refined by those experiences that now I wouldn't change any of that for the world even though I hated every minute of it at the time. Hindsight is really important. I think to my own life when I think about experiencing miscarriage, um, the sudden death of my father in an accident at home, uh, having a serious knee injury. Um, I think of a period of uh, two or three years ago now where one of my best friends died, the lockdowns kicked in while we were going through the adoption process. There were some difficulties in the leadership of, uh, of the church, our building had flooded, we spent months putting it all back together, we were just about to reopen it and it flooded again and on that morning that I woke up it was just like, man I think that's enough things to have gone wrong at the same time for me. The many colours of trial. I can't tell you that any of that at any point felt like a pure joy at the time, but I can now see how God's refined me, how he's taught me, how he's shaped me, how he's humbled me. And I do realize though that most of the things that I've just described are a little bit like first world problems, if you know what I mean. There are people who experience way more than I ever have. So you might be thinking to yourself, yeah, all right, Dave, fair enough, but you've had quite a sheltered existence. And you'd be right. I recognize that, that I have not been through what other people have. But James is different. It's different for the people he's writing to. He lives in Jerusalem. Stephen was stoned to death for his faith. Writing to people dispersed because of persecution. So I'm not standing here from my ivory tower like telling everyone how it should be. I'm pointing you to James. It's a little bit like when someone like Igor has been to our church from Ukraine and all that, has, that they've been through and then he speaks. They've been through so much hardship and difficulty but you just see it in him, the perseverance, the maturity that's been birthed in him. And so we want James's words in those experiences to come alive in our hearts. 
And you know what I've said um, already about, I think the hindsight is really important as we understand this part of the passage. I, I, I don't recommend the pastoral response to someone who is facing hardship at that exact time to say to them then and there, consider this pure joy because this is building perseverance that leads to maturity. No, I suggest if that's how we, it might be true, but I suggest that if we respond to people like that, we might meet a slightly different response that could be in some traditional Anglo-Saxon perhaps, or maybe enjoy a fist. So, uh, so I'm not recommending that, but it's with hindsight as we look back ourselves, as we see what God has done through it. The situation I know was awful, but what I see of God in it now brings me pure joy. I can now consider it pure joy as I look at the work of God. So James is clear. We will face trials. Through those trials, we will have an opportunity to grow in God in ways that we could never imagine. In 1 Peter 4, 2, he says uh, from verse 12, Beloved, beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. So trials happen. It's not a surprise. It's not something strange. It will happen. And on that day, God will be just as at work or even more at work than he was in the day of blessing. Except the fruit in those days, the majority of the fruit in those days will be inside us rather than on the outside for everybody to see. From verse 5 then, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Wow, James, thanks for dressing that up and not getting straight to the point. Gosh, I told you it was full of warnings and stuff, didn't I? And this is another example, like a good example, even right at the beginning of him just starting a new conversation and heading off into a different direction. If you lack wisdom, ask for it. If you really don't know what to do, ask the Lord. If you keep on making poor choices, ask the Lord. Ask God who gives to all generously. There's no lack of supply to those who ask. God is really serious about this. If we ask him, he will. He will. And if he is who he is, then we can ask him without doubting. And if he isn't who he is, then why are we asking? Our view of God makes a huge difference. When we pray, is it like asking a king for him to enact his authority on our behalf? Or is it like buying a lottery ticket and hoping that our numbers come up this time if we doubt God as we ask him are we kind of like asking a God we don't really believe in if we do ask God it's because of who he is so we can have real faith in him and not be double-minded from verse 9 believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position but the rich should take pride in their humiliation since they will pass away like a wildflower For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossom falls and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away even while they go about their business. Here we go, James. Another handbrake turn. It's like one of those roads they go on, those Top Gear adventures, and they're going up the mountain, and they're just doing that, and they keep switching in different directions. But there is some purpose in this. Because the people he's writing to are likely to be in poverty now because they've had to flee. So that is one of the very real trials that they are going through. If you're in humble circumstances, take pride. Because you may not have all the same stuff as others, but your future glory is better than any of it. But if you're rich, if you've got it all, Rejoice in the fact that despite of your earthly success, you've been humbled to the extent of knowing your own sin, your need of salvation, and you've been able to respond to it. Take pride in the fact that all of this stuff is just temporary and it will fade away, but your future glory is better than all of it. 
Both of those responses are the maturity in our circumstances that James is calling us to. Patient in our circumstances if we have little, humble in our circumstances if we have much. The poor person can say, I am rich in every blessing in Christ. And the rich person can sing, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. The person of low status in the world is reminded of how high they're taken in Christ. And the person of high status is reminded of how low they were in their sin when Christ rescued them for eternity. Whatever your circumstances, God turns the tables. He he keeps keeps us humble. He shows us how it really is all about him and how much we need him. From verse 12, blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they're dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then, after the desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's fully grown, gives birth to death. So James has started out with what's happening um, outside of us in our lives, the trials we face, external forces, using especially the example of poverty and wealth. But now we switch and we're looking at the human heart. The goal of life is to love God and it's that love of God that will allow us to withstand the trials that we face and receive the crown of life, the promise that we have in eternity. What attracts this this reward from God, it's not their endurance, it's that they love him. But it's their love for him that gives them the strength to endure. They show their love by enduring If you really love someone, you don't give up on them when the going gets tough. But there's another U-turn right in the middle of that section that uh, that I've just uh, spoken about because he goes from endurance and love that leads us to life to the pathway to death. And in some ways, how he's writing actually mirrors our experience in life. We're going along, uh, we're in blessing, things seem to be going really well, Bang, a trial comes out of nowhere. A challenge we're facing comes out of absolute nowhere. Sometimes we're walking along in in faith and uh, things are going well and then man, we just fall into sin. We just slip back into it again. In every challenge or trial, it's easier to slip back than it is to continue to step forward, back to the old coping mechanisms, back to the the things we used to rely on to bring comfort, back to the ways we used to respond, the things that we used to escape from the reality that we are facing, but it's not God who's tempting us. Inside each and every one of us, there's desires and there's thoughts, there's there's feelings which come from our flesh. They belong in our old life. They're, They're what we were saved from, but sometimes they come to the surface and you have that dark thought out of nowhere. Gosh, that would be nice. And if we don't run away from the very thought of it, if we let it fester, if we, if we allow ourselves to, to go along that journey, that thought process of imagining things, then it says here, it's like, it's like having a baby where, where it's conceived and then it's grown and it grows and then it's birthed and we actually do something. And we actually do something where sometimes, like minutes before, We would have never dreamed that we would have ended up in that situation, but that thought has conceived and grown and birthed in our life, and it's almost come out of nowhere, or sometimes it happens over a very long period of time. I've always liked the the analogy that sin is a little bit like a cliff edge. And if sin is like a cliff edge that we don't want to fall off, then where do we build the fence in our life? Do we put the fence right on the edge of the cliff where we can go and admire the view and be reminded of what we're missing out on and occasionally climb over? Or do we put the fence way back so we can't even see the cliff, so it doesn't even come to mind? 
And it's up to individuals to work out what their boundaries are and where they need them to be. But I would encourage us, James would exhort us to be cautious. And now our section comes into land with a bump, really, uh, which is no surprise considering the way that James has been driving so far. And uh, here we are from verse 16. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. So we are on this journey of facing trials. We will endure because we love God. Our eternity is secure with him. And even though we're warned about messing up on the way, but he's saying, don't be deceived. Don't be robbed of your focus. Everything good comes from God and he's chosen to give us supernatural birth. God created everything and saw that it was good and he has recreated us. He has made us a new creation in Christ. This is amazing truth and if if we stand back from this passage and just look at the bigger picture that James is painting for us, We see that every Christian has got the capacity to sin and to slip because of what's still inside them. But that same person is a new creation in Christ, now designed to bear fruit, now designed to stand firm and to live wholeheartedly for God no matter what the circumstances of the day, no matter what their earthly future looks like. They have been supernaturally created for more. Their eternal destiny is secure and they're walking towards it, showing hallmarks of where they are to be. They're showing reflections of what their destiny is leading them to. So this passage is it's really honest. It contains lots of warnings. It deals with some dark parts of our hearts. And then it lifts our gaze right at the end here. It's almost like James reaches out, takes our chin and lifts our gaze once more back to God and his purpose and his power and his will at work in our lives. We can do this because of him. So next time you face temptation... Next time you face a major trial in your life, he's still the answer. He's the go-to. He's the, he's the emergency button. Lift your gaze to him. Or if you're in the place of blessing, lift your gaze to him. Let's throw off the things to the side that hinder us and fix our gaze on him, the author, the perfecter of our faith. It's a real rallying cry to people who've experienced dreadful circumstances, physical violence against them, total upheaval, and it's lift your eyes to Jesus, focus on God, see his purposes, and hold on to him. I'd love to finish by praying. Father, I want to thank you for this tough passage that contains lots of warnings and challenge, but I want to thank you that our future is safe with you and that we have the hope of eternity without any of this hardship, without any of this drama. We have that great hope. Father, I want to thank you that you lead us through trials and difficulties in our lives. You're not absent even when the going gets tough. And I pray, Lord, that anyone now listening to this who is going through that season of difficulty, would they know that in their hearts, Lord, that you are with them. Lord, thank you that through the difficulties that we face, you bring us to maturity, that we we see more of you. We know that your light shines brightly in the darkness. And I thank you too, Lord, that you've placed us together in community so that we can walk through this together a lot of this is about our relationship with you how we respond to you how we choose to follow you but thank you that you're not asking any of us to fly solo in this you've placed us in the family so we can spur each other on in that place so help us lord this week to consider brothers and sisters in our family 
who are facing trials and how, how can we help? How can we encourage? How can we get alongside and impart courage to so that we can journey forward together? How can we lift each other's gaze to you so we can continue to live wholeheartedly for you? Would you speak to us this week, Lord? Would you show us what it means when we work? Would you show us what it means in our home, Lord, to keep our gaze, to keep our eyes focused on you? Amen.